Father, thank you for your word this morning, and thank you for your presence here. Thank you, Lord, that you have so much to teach us and so much to reveal to us. But, Lord, it's like going to Hawaii and finding a waterfall we never knew was there. It never gets old, Lord, with you because we, we discover your wisdom and your plan and your truth. We discover your character. We discover your heart, Lord. And we, we can't believe how powerful this book is. It, it, it just can't be just a historical book. The Lord, your spirit has made your words alive. So they dance on into our lives and begin to frame things within us. Your word comes in and gives us light for our next step and, and a lamp for our future. Your word illuminates our past and starts making sense out of the things that, that happen to us. And Lord, I thank you so much that we have a security of a heavenly father who's parenting us. That we're not just... Um, we're not left alone and to ourselves. And also thank you, Jesus, for sending the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth. Lord, I pray we would be stubborn, that we'd be easily guided, that we'd not only um, be guided, but we'd be like, um, we'd be anticipating where you're leading us. Lord, um, may you be heard this morning. May your truths be understood respected, admired, and clung to. May we even forget where we heard these things, who was the speaker, what church we were at. But may your word endure within us. And may the cares of this world, the pleasures of this life, and the riches of this life not choke it out. Let your word bring forth fruit that remains so that, Father, you would be glorified. And that we wouldn't go around preaching ourselves or preaching... Um, man's doctrine or cleverly devised stories, but Lord, that your truths would be held out for drowning people to hold on to, and that your people, all of us, would be firmly established in your ways, because they are sure and reliable. We also lift up every household represented in this room, or anyone who's listening. We pray that your spirit would fall upon those who um, have yet to know you, and they would recognize Christ, and they'd see their sin, and they'd know he's the remedy. We pray for the backslider in our homes and our families, that they would uh, smell the pigs and wake up and come home. And we pray for those who are walking with you, that today they would be greatly encouraged by your love and your faithfulness, and that, Lord, they would sense um, that open relationship they have with you through the blood of Christ and take advantage of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are in Hebrews 11. Remember, we're talking about the, um, the people who lived before the Messiah. And in Hebrews 11, there's a lot of people that are being spoken about. And the Jewish believers, Hebrew Christians, would have appreciated this um, focus and attention on their heroes. I love that song we sang, you know, we will talk with the saints of old. And you know, we think of Paul and Timothy and John, and, but these Jews were like Moses and Abraham. And, and what do you mean the Messiah was that their lives were, were demonstrating the coming of the Messiah, even though they didn't see it? When Moses esteemed the reproaches of Christ, he didn't really know that that was Christ, but that he was esteeming something he didn't recognize in its complete... Um, understanding. I know Sunday morning my husband taught on recognizing Jesus and just how they were out there in the boat and Jesus would say, hey, did you, did you catch anything or do you have any meat? And they're like, they, they weren't even supposed to be fishing anymore. And when they put that distance between them and Christ, they didn't even recognize him. On the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him. You know, that even though he was right in front of them, they didn't recognize him. And so in the Old Testament, when the people were walking through the eyes of faith and doing the things that, that God and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob told them to do, they were very much being great examples of the coming Messiah, and they didn't even know they were doing that. And that, that's kind of fun, because we're on this side, and we're looking back and going, oh, and we see how it all fits together. I know if, if you ever watch a crime show, anything like that, if you've seen it before, you're like... You know, you're watching it, and you're going, yeah, I know, and he did it. No, she didn't. Why are they investigating him? I know he didn't do that. 
It's easy for us because we've already seen it. But this is the way it is with the Old Testament. And we're going to start in Hebrews 11, verse 30. Maureen. I'll turn that. Okay. I'm just going to have to go ahead. Okay. I just went up. Yeah. Hebrews 11, 30. Hebrews 11, 30 says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. And so you're going, well, what do you mean by faith the walls of Jericho fell down? A lot of you know the story of Jericho and the way they conquered it. But it says here that the very walls that surrounded Jericho, they fell down by faith. Well, what does that mean? Well, they fell down because the people of God did what God asked them to do. They followed the battle plan that God had for that walled city. Now, if you go through the entire taking of the promised land, it's a great story. You read to Joshua. There was a different battle strategy with each particular battle they had to face. As a matter of fact, one time Joshua just decided to handle it. Oh, I know how to do this now. I'm a warrior. God's called me. I'm going to go in and AI, and we're just going to take them. And if you remember, they lost that battle of AI. And then they never prayed. They never asked God for his strategy. And there's one thing we need to learn is we don't just rely on the strategies he's given us in the past. We seek him to see if it's the same strategy. Let's work with this kid, I'm going to do it with this kid, I'm going to do it with this kid. You know, they're, they're perfectly and wonderfully made. And we have to seek the Lord on these things. That's faith, that's trust, that's dependency. That's coming to the Lord and saying, you know, what, what do you want, Lord? What is your strategy? The people of God with Jericho did not do what they logically and intuitively would do to conquer a walled city. This is not something that people would do. With, and what we're going to cover, in case you're not familiar with the story, <clears throat> when they did this, things fell down that should not have fallen down. It didn't make sense with a battle uh, strategy, a, mili a military mindset. This wasn't the way it's supposed to be won. You know, like we were talking about prayer last week, more can be fought <laughs> through praying to God for someone than trying to reason with them. More can be done with these, these weapons that are mighty through God that can pull down strongholds and the things we can do with the arm of flesh. Programs, strategies, lights that change color during worship. All these things, I'm not against those, but those are not the things that win the battles. It's, it's the things that don't make sense that make a difference. What did Joshua experience to give him the confidence and leading others to do what God says would save them, rather than they would what they would do. How, how could Joshua, in 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 all certain, because Joshua was a military leader, by the way, Moses wasn't. Joshua was. He was trained to be a military leader. But what was it that would make a military leader say, "Hey, we're not really we're going to march around the city and for these many days"? And why why would he have the confidence to give someone that direction? Because they would think that this is the way that they would be saved from the city. And in, in the world, people say, this is how I'm going to get to heaven, by doing more good works than bad. And then we come and say, no, that's not how you're saved. We are saved through the work of a man on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago that you don't have to put your faith in. That doesn't make sense. What would a death 2,000 years ago have to do with the sin that I fornicated, that I got involved in homosexuality, that I was looking at pornography, that I stole something, that I was arrogant and looked down on someone? Why would blood shed 2,000 years ago all the way across the globe have anything to do with me? How can we with confidence preach the gospel to people knowing that this is truth even though it doesn't make sense intuitively to people? It's when we encounter the God who came up with the strategy that gives us the boldness to preach the strategy. It's really not just the message. It's the messenger who says it. And look at Joshua 5.13. This is right before they, he had to tell them what to do. In Joshua 5.13, it says, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, this is right before they did this, that he lifted his eyes and he looked. And behold, a man stood opposite Joshua with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to this man and said to him, Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? Joshua did not recognize whether this was of the Lord or not. And I love where it first says Joshua lifted his eyes. Before he assessed the walls, he lifted his eyes. 
before you, let's scale the city and figure out how we're going to conquer. He lifted his eyes. Before we try to conquer anything, before we want to see a stronghold taken down, we need to lift our eyes. Psalm 121 1 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where comes my help? My help. I don't know about your help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And before he looked at this overwhelmingly fortified city that there's no way this ragamuffin of a crew that just passed through the wilderness could conquer, he didn't look at the city first. He lifted up his eyes. And when he did, he saw someone. He saw someone with a sword drawn in his hand. He didn't just have a sword here. This was someone who, who looked like they were ready to fight. Joshua did not recognize who this was and didn't even know, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? You ever done that? Is this the Lord or is it the devil? Yeah. I hate that, actually. It's one of my least favorite parts of the whole thing. It's like, why don't I know? But sometimes we don't. And it's okay, Joshua didn't know. We grow in our ability to discern the voice of the Lord. And, and we have to be careful because, you know, way back in Nineveh, you know, Jonah, I gotta get away from this. Oh, look, a boat's right here taking me in the opposite direction of Nineveh. It must be the Lord. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't, but sometimes we go, oh, look, it all lined up. Wow, this guy, you know, he came into my life and he knows two verses. He must be the one for me. You know, like we can, we can discern things wrong. And that's why we don't, we don't, we're not wise in our own opinion. And Joshua, you know, he didn't know yet. He was growing in his ability to discern. And we're allowed to grow in that, ladies. Be patient with one another. Be patient with yourself. We're growing in this. In Hebrews 5.14, it says, those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That's why it's always fun to have people that have been walking the Lord a little longer than you, huh? Because like, I don't know. There's this man, he has a sword drawn, and I just don't know if it's of the Lord or it's not. And sometimes they can help you see that because by reason of use, they have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. But we're all, it's, I noticed too, it, we gain the ability to discern by use. Not by years. I accepted the Lord when I was you know, 25 years ago. I haven't used anything, but you, know, well, you still might not have discernment. <laughs> if somebody younger in the Lord might have more discernment than you do because they're using it and they're walking with it and they're making mistakes and learning and growing. So when we are growing in faith, we have to know that Joshua asked, are you for us? Or are you for our adversaries? And it says that he asked him this. And, and when we're growing in faith, we are allowed to ask questions. Faith is not not having questions. Okay? Faith is questioning with the intent of cooperating and obeying. This shows you really do want to do what God wants you to do when you ask for questions, when you ask questions for answers, because you want to get on board with the Lord. Questioning is not a sign of not believing. It's that sometimes you want more details so you're sure to obey. It's not because I, I don't. It, 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 it's the difference. You remember Mary when she was told she was going to conceive the Messiah? And she said, how shall this be? I haven't been with a man. She was not rebuked for that. She was like, okay, totally don't know about virgin birth because it never happened before. And Zacharias, when he was told that his wife Elizabeth would conceive, and he said, how shall this be? She's barren. He was, he was smitten for it, and he was rebuked for it. Because for him, you could almost hear with his tone, was like, how can this be? She's barren. Plus, Abraham and Sarah had already happened in history. They had already seen God do that. So we never had the virgin birth before. Mary had no idea how that was going to work. And also, I believe she was kind of saying, where do I need to be? Like, what do I need to do to cooperate with this thing? When we ask God for information with the intent of obedience, we are walking in faith. Because we're saying, okay, what's next? What do you want me to do? How can I cooperate with you? These questions are questions of faith. And he's saying, are you for us? Are you against us? Basically, am I not supposed to be battling Jericho right now? Like, are you saying, get your hands off of Jericho, I don't want you to conquer it right now? Or are you with us and you want us to conquer Jericho? He was growing and discerning God's will. Verse 14 of this place in Joshua, it says, so he said, this man with the sword, says, no, 
But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and he worshiped. And he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? In verse 15, then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Before he ever gave the command to march around the city, he got in touch with the one who gives the commands. He, he saw him, he knew him, he worshiped him. So then when he got the instructions, he could with confidence give it to someone else. That's why those of us who have come to know Christ can give the clear gospel to people because we know whom we have believed. But we say, no, it is by grace through faith. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. I know because I have come in contact with the commander of the Lord's army. And this is his strategy to beat sin in your life. I'm confident of it. Well, it doesn't make any sense. Well, it didn't make any sense to march around Jericho either. And the walls still came down. And I'm telling you that my life was changed because I believed and I've met him. And I want you to know him as well. This is an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And he is the commander of the army of the Lord. It's called the Lord of Hosts. You see, he's the commander of the army of the Lord. Do you love knowing that about Jesus? You know, you just say, send your troops. Don't tell them how to fight the battle. Say, send your troops on that person. I don't know how you want to do it, but you send those troops to fight for that person. And he's the commander of the Lord's army. Joshua needed to know you're really not in charge. You know, you're really not in charge. Mama, you're really not in charge of those kids. You know, Joshua, you're really not the one in charge. I am the commander. And he wanted him to know that. And it was after Joshua recognizes the Lord that Joshua receives from the Lord. When Joshua worships the Lord, Joshua yields to the Lord. Are you resisting something that God is doing? Are you leaning on your own understanding? Have you ever just put that child before the Lord and said, I trust you with this person. I believe you love them more than I love them. Have you gotten in touch with his heart for them or is it all about you and the way it's affecting you? God wants to take us beyond that. Yes, sin is horrible. And when people are messed up, we feel it. We have to go to the jail. We have to go to that. You have to build them out again. You have to deal with their attitudes. I know it's ugly. But God wants us to go beyond how it affects us and see his heart for those people. He wants us to say, see, it is ugly. Now, I love them anyway. And he's the commander of the Lord's army. He didn't want Joshua to approach Jericho with logic. He wanted him to approach Jericho according to the command of the one whose sword is drawn. The Lord's sword is drawn for the things that we need to conquer and that we want him to conquer in people's lives around us. As David declared before he conquered Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 47, David said, Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now we can say this because we know the script. The Christians, yeah, the battle belongs to the Lord. And then we go in and we try to do everything. We sing it on Sunday morning, and Monday we are just fighting with the flesh. You know, we have to remember it, it, the battle belongs to the Lord. If the battle belongs to the Lord, he may use us. It doesn't mean that we're passive. But it also doesn't mean that we decide how he's going to use us. We make ourselves available. We pray. We say, God, use me in this person's life, but let me sense how you want to use me. and Help me not run ahead of what you want to do. And help me not shrink back if you say, I want you to do this. Well, I don't know. You know we pray for the person, oh, well, me, invite them to the harvest. <laughs> but if you said to do it, or take them out to lunch and share with them the gospel, me, yes, you, I want to use you. But the battle belongs to the Lord. <coughs> Jesus is the one who knows how to conquer things. And it's not necessarily the strategy that we would come up with. I'm confident that when Joshua considered approaching Jericho, they did not say, well, maybe he'd want us to march around so the walls fall down. I don't think it entered into his mind, this particular strategy. And I believe that in the battles in our lives that God has strategies that have not entered into our minds. And when we're praying specifically, God may put on our heart a strategy we might never have thought of 
if we are open and not so um, intent on seeing the way we think God should do something in someone's life. I know when I first got saved, um, and I read a Bible verse that I got saved by, I, I, I was sure that the reason why I got saved was because of that verse. That's the magic verse. And if I just preach that verse to everyone because it worked on me, everybody else was going to get saved from the same verse. And so I did. I went to school the next day after I got saved, and I went to all my friends, and I opened it up. I was like, look, look what it says. And I showed them those seven words, and I waited for what happened to me to happen to them. It didn't. <laughs> I'm going, okay, I, got, I see it. It made me born again. But it wasn't necessarily the verse that was going to save them. And you kind of learn that you don't know the way. God. And God knows people better than we do. You know, you think you know people. I know yesterday, I, I, was, I was thinking about this because we were over at the mall in Cerritos, and we went to get some um, tea at Coffee Bean. And my husband um, doesn't like a lot of ice in his drinks. I do. Especially that really fun, crunchy little ice. I don't know. I just feel like I have a whole meal for an hour with that. So we went up there, and we ordered our tea. And then my husband said to them, I want light, light ice, he said. But I didn't say anything. He goes, I didn't want light ice. So I go over, we go to pick up our teas, and they gave us both light ice. So then I, I told Leigh, I go, you know, um, he's the only one that wanted light ice. I, I don't want light ice. I, I, want, I want ice, please. And then she says, oh, that's why, you know, because it's hot, huh? We tell you not to have, you know, that we make the tea hot, and now it's warm, and you ask for light ice, and now you want, you know, ice, and that's why we put more ice. What? So I said, I go, actually, mine's nice and cold, and it really has nothing to do with the temperature of the, of the ice. Um, I just like the ice, and I also I have this swallowing disorder, and when I chew ice, I can get more hydration, because I can't drink fast. <laughs> and I'm going, I go, see, I told her this. She would know that I have dysphagia from salivary gland adenoid cystic carcinoma, oh, and that's why I really enjoy <laughs> hydrating myself with this soft ice. Because you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and she she just figured it out because a lot of people probably come back and say the tea's hot, and well, if you ask for light ice, that's why we give you more ice. She probably encountered that often, and she just projected on me that that's probably what I do. And she was young, you know, 16 or 17, and usually when you're around that age, you kind of think you've experienced every case scenario <laughs> and the way you decide that things should be, should be. Now, I meet a lot of people in their 50s that still act like they're 16 or 17. They still think that they know why these things are the way they are. And we don't know why. And that's why when God has strategies, we, you know, it, no matter how long we walk with the Lord, we are not the Lord. And no matter how much our senses are exercised to discern good and evil, we have to remain, you know, maybe never lose our wonder. With those wives, just humble before the Lord when we're praying for people. Humble when we're asking how to beat something in our lives. You know, I'm a strategist. That's my nature. That's my degree is in systems analysis and design, systems design. That's the way my mind thinks. God has had to purge me of those things when I'm praying for things. I really, I've had to empty out the way I naturally think put on the mind of Christ and be humble and quiet and come to him and not project and anticipate the way I think he's going to answer my prayers. Even this morning I was praying about something in my life that I really believe needs to change. And I just said, Lord, I, I, I just said, I need help in this area. I don't know how to do this and I don't want to predict. But let me be sensitive when you lead me in this solution. Let me sense the leading of your spirit. Or even if I don't know it's the answer to this prayer, let me do what you tell me to do. And maybe I won't even see it for like six months. I go, oh my God, she's pulling out of my bear. I, like, don't, I don't even need to see it. Just leave me. And let me be obedient, trusting that you heard my prayer and you're going to take care of this thing in my life. In Joshua 6.1, it says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, Look, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you're going to do for six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. 
and the priest shall blow the trumpets. Verse 5. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. God had given the city into their hand by his sword. Now they just had to walk around it. When they shouted, the walls fell down flat. By the way, the walls did not crumble, like we always sing, and the walls came crumbling. <laughs> they fell flat out, like they fell. So people could just walk over them and get into the city. It was just all around, just like, you know, just fell flat. And they were able to go and walk and walk right in to the city. Isn't that like just a neat thing? It's like God just unwrapped the package. <laughs> you know, I've given this to you. Open to that. And when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with our mouth, salvation is ours. When they shouted, it opened. When we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, everything is, is open to us. We have access to the Lord. We don't earn our salvation. We didn't fight for our salvation. The battle belongs to the Lord. Every battle, and the most important battle, is ours with our own sinful nature and the fact that we were born into sin and we deserve judgment. God took care of that. Jesus fought that battle against the enemy. And now we can just walk on in and enjoy the things that God has for us. Okay, back to Hebrews 11. That was Joshua. Verse 31. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Okay, that was back in Joshua 2. When she was, uh, she lived inside the city walls. They had like a uh, little place that she could live in there. She was a harlot. She was a prostitute. And she hid the spies. In Joshua 2.17, the men that she had hidden said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours which you have made us swear. She goes, when you guys conquer us, please save me and my family. Verse 18 of Joshua 2. Unless, when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your home, verse 19, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood's going to be on his own head, and we will, we, will not be, we will be guiltless. Whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And I'm going to move past that. Okay, so the scarlet cord, that was another thing that foreshadowed the scarlet, the blood of Jesus Christ. That that was outside her house, a Gentile's house. And everybody who was in the house covered by the scarlet cord was saved from the destruction of the Jewish people. It was symbolic, like the Passover lamb's blood. That, you know, do you have the scarlet cord of Jesus' blood on your life? Then we are protected. They didn't do the lamb with the Gentiles. They did this scarlet cord, but it still was scarlet to show that really that, that what they did not see was coming was the Messiah. And everybody who's under that blood is saved, not because of their own works, but because of the red scarlet cord that was out there. And it's really neat about her because she ends up being in the lineage of Christ. She is Boaz's mother and she becomes David's great grandmother, Rahab the harlot. I mean, she doesn't just get saved, she gets grafted in. You know, and that is so exciting for us in Christ that we aren't just saved, we now are heirs with the nation of Israel for so many promises and covenants. We're so grateful. Like We were all Rahab's, and now we are all in the lineage, and our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Sunday morning, I pulled up outside, and one of our watchmen, the security people, uh, came up to me, and he goes, oh, I, I hear you're famous. I go, what? And he goes, he goes, I heard you on the radio. I go, oh. I go, you know what really makes you famous? He goes, what? And I go, my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> I go, oh, so yours. He goes, that's right. I go, oh, we're both so famous. You know, that we were written down there and written on the palm of his hand and we're written in that Lamb's Book of Life. Don't let the accuser of our brethren tell you that you are not saved because of something you did or didn't do. Let the cord, the scarlet cord, know that that protects you and that you not only are saved, but you end up traveling along with, with those people conquering every battle with God's people and grafted in to the point where she becomes David's great-grandmother. That's like crazy. 
And she's in there when you read the lineage of Christ that that blood made her a special person, a vessel that God wanted to use all because of the scarlet cord. Verse 32. And what more shall I say? Hebrews 11. For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, Obama, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, and also of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. So the person, the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, are you getting it? All these people in the Old Testament are representatives of what the Messiah was going to do for everybody ultimately. And they all lived by faith, and their lives glorified a God who had a plan that they didn't see, nor did they get to see the Messiah in their day. But what they did, the way they trusted him, played out well in their lives and painted a beautiful picture for those of us who would wonder, is Jesus really the Messiah? And might I remind you that this is a fair question, ladies. Don't, don't cram this down anybody's throat. They're allowed to explore because they don't really have their faith in Christ unless they really believe he is the Christ. So let people work through their searchings. Encourage people to ask questions. Don't demand belief. You can't demand belief. Belief has to be freely given. Answer people because you meet the unsaved and say, hey, do you have any questions about this? And you meet a Muslim person and say, hey, I'm a Christian. If you ever want to know like anything about Jesus, I'm, I'll be here and I promise I'll, I'll, I won't you know, irritate you. <laughs> I'll answer your questions. I want you to know him like I know him. I'll introduce you to him. I'll, I'll, I'll connect you with him in any way that I can and, and make ourselves available to that. And it says what all these people were living by faith and obedience and they foreshadowed the plan of salvation. Uh, we're only going to look at one of these in this list and it's Samson. Look at Judges 16.21. Samson was a man of God, and um, even though he didn't really like it, but he was set apart by the Lord. Samson's so encouraging for anybody who struggles with the flesh. Judges 16.21. It says, and Samson was caught by the Philistines, but he was supposed to be used by the Lord and looked like his life was over. But Judges 16.21, it says the Philistines took him, took Samson, and they put out his eyes. Like they cut him out of his eyes. They took his eyes out. And this is very interesting. Because remember, faith is the evidence of unseen. And here's another person that can't see. Now, when Samson could see, he could see all the beautiful women. <laughs> and it was his demise. It messed him up. His sight worked against him. Now his eyes are taken away. And just last night, I was looking at this uh, this. Uh, picture, and you're going, ooh, that's gross, but um, because of the cancer I have and just some situations with my eyes, I was researching some things because it can travel to the lacrimal gland, and um, this lady was 101 years old, and she was diagnosed with adenoid cystic carcinoma at 101 in her lacrimal gland. It was one of the places that is in the rear duct, and they removed her eye. They took out her eye, because that's what they do if it goes into your eye, you remove your eye. And so they took her eye out. And I saw her last night. I saw the picture of her. She, she had an eye. They were showing it where they took it out. I went, 101? She had her eye removed? And she was just ready to, you know, keep fighting, you know. <laughs> Even at that age, I'm like, this lady, I was so impressed with her. that she, she went through that surgery. She made it through. And she's willing to have pictures taken and explain what happens. And, you know, just resilient like that. And she still had one eye left. But, you know, when you remove eyes. You know, when you can't see, I remember when I was first diagnosed and they said, you're probably going to lose your, your taste. And, you know, I lost half of my taste buds. And they said, they could travel your lacrimal gland and they're going to move your eye. And I remember I was upstairs and I started crying. I go, oh my gosh, this is a really ugly road. I could end up not seeing and not tasting. And the Lord goes, <coughs> taste and see that the Lord, he is good. Because you'll always be able to taste me. You'll always be able to see me. I went, oh, that's so neat that those two senses are in that verse, and those were the two I was like concerned about. Not everybody's thinking about not tasting and not seeing. I had even written a song that had that in it, and then my life was experiencing tasting and seeing loss. Is that just bizarre or what? Mm -hmm. And with Samson, his eyes, when Samson's eyes were removed, he became, he fulfilled his calling when he couldn't see. And he wasn't fulfilling his calling when he could. And it says there, they pulled out his eyes, put out his eyes, and they brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters. He became a grinder in the prison. It's so sad. He would just help 
a pole, because he's very strong, the millstone that would grind the wheat. Instead of an animal doing it, they had him doing it. Verse 22, however, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Verse 23, the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, our god has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. Verse 24, and when the people saw him, they praised their god. For they said, our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, the one who multiplied our dead. Verse 25, so it happened when their hearts were merry, that means when they were drunk, that they said, call for Samson so he can perform for us. They said, let's get this blind man and mock him and rejoice and crack up that he's going to stumble and fall into everything. And this is what the enemy does. The whole study of Samson is pretty intense. He gets you in his courts and he just mocks you. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them. And they put him between two pillars. And Samson, verse 26, said to this little boy who held him by the hand, helping him, let me feel the pillars which support this temple of Dagon, so I can lean on them. Verse 27. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistine were there, all the leaders. About 3,000 men and women were on the roof watching while Samson performs. So they're all gathered around. He's blind. They're laughing at this blind person. Verse 28, then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once. O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines from my two eyes. In verse 29, Samson took a hold of the two little pillars which support the temple. He braced himself against them, one on his right hand and left. Verse 30, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords of all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed with his life. Now, who is that like in that Who through his death conquered the enemy? Who in his weakness conquered the enemy? Acts 8.32 says that Jesus was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before it sure is silent. So he opened not his mouth, verse 33. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation where his life is taken from the earth? That is Jesus Christ. And Samson's life was foreshadowing what Christ would have In Christ's weakness is, is when he was the strongest. And in Christ's death and silence, the, the sound of the blood dropping on the earth did more for us than all the teaching and the miracles and the fish and the loaves. It was the quiet dripping of sinless blood from the dust of the earth that had more power than all the teaching. The teaching can't save us. We love the teaching. It cannot save us. It is the blood of Christ. In verse 33 of Hebrews 11, it says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, verse 34, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of, of strangers. Women received their dead raised to life. Others, they were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Verse 36, still others had trial of mockings and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. Verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. Now, does this sound like a lot of faith preachers today? I don't hear the people coming up and saying, any of can be tortured and not accepted. Deliverance. <laughs> Through faith, you can wander around being scourged and imprisoned. Your life can fall apart in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's believe that God will allow us to be afflicted this week. You just don't hear it. But that's what real faith is. There's nothing wrong with people being positive and motivational speakers. I'm not against that. But I'm saying the biblical faith is not that. That's not what the Bible teaches faith is. That's a new brand that America has put on. It doesn't work in Kenya. You cannot go there and have teach people those things. It doesn't work there. Because it's not a biblical teaching. It's just a, a motivational teaching. And I love where it says, of whom the world was not worthy. Verse 38, they wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. They 
didn't have the Messiah yet. I'm going to close in Galatians. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Because he did not receive the promise. We're always taught that faith is receiving the promise. But it's interesting, faith is not having to have the promise. It's able to trust. I don't need to, I don't need you to do anything about it. You died for me. It's great if you do things, but if you don't, I have you. And you're worth more than anything you could do for me. Just you are the one I owe me. You know, like I told you that people that get cancer, sometimes the, the husband leaves often. When the wife gets cancer, the, the husband leaves the wife. And we heard this, and we read it, and we know it. Because she can't do what she normally did for him, like cook and take care of him and this and that. So did he really love her? Or did he just love what she did? Or if you're a believer, do you really love God? Or just what he can do for you? Our commitment has to be to him. And he blesses us, he loves us, he does great things for us, but that's not why we love him. We love him because he's incredible and he deserves to be loved, respected, and obeyed. Galatians 3.22 says, remember they did not receive the promise. Galatians 3.22 says, but the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith, hear that promise? Promise by faith. They did not receive the promise back then. Galatians says, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. Kept what? For the faith which would afterwards be revealed. Verse 24. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. Why? That we might be justified by faith. Lord, thank you for your plan and your promises. Thank you for your word. I just ask, Lord, that we would be a people who respect your plan. And we don't change it because it's uncomfortable or we don't like something about it. Or some preacher that we admire preaches something differently. That, Lord, we would pledge allegiance to your word and to your truth and put confidence in what you have revealed. Father, I ask and pray, Lord, that each one of us in this room would understand that it is you that did the work that you are the commander of the Lord's army, that you have the sword drawn. And because you have the sword drawn, you want us to conquer things in our lives, not um, with religion, and not with works, and not with the normal battle strategy that we would use to get right with God, but that the battle belongs to you. And Jesus, you went before us. You fought sin like Samson. You know, you laid down your life so we could be saved from the enemy. And we so appreciate that, Jesus. And I ask Lord, that each one of us be absolutely committed to you, regardless of whether we wander in caves or we're living in a palace. Like Moses, we could leave this riches of Egypt for the reproaches of Christ. We'd rather be, we'd rather be mocked in the name of Jesus than rewarded in the name of sin. We would rather be isolated and looked down upon for our for identifying with you than to have the world give us their accolades because we're identifying with this world. Lord, I pray that our treasures and our values would reflect that you are worth more than anything this world has to offer. In Jesus' name, amen.